This week I came across a brand new podcast that I had never seen before. It was called Adulting, and as soon as I saw the title, I thought, man, that reminds me of the message series that we're kind of in right now called Real Mature. And so I thought to myself, well, if they're explaining to people what it looks like to act like an adult, I want to know what kind of stuff they're talking about. And so I hopped on their page, and I didn't listen to any of their podcasts, but I did scroll through all of their contents. And as I scrolled through their contents and kind of thought about how they were describing to people what it looked like to act like an adult, kind of was left scratching my head and shaking it in disbelief. In fact, I'll share just a few of their episode titles with you. In September of 2019, they published a 33-minute episode that was designed to answer this one question. How many pairs of underwear do I need to pack for a weekend trip? I am not making this up, okay? This is, this is real, okay? Did, it, did I mention the title of the podcast? It, it's, it's called Adulting, okay? So just keep that in mind. We'll go on. In August of that same year, they put out a 39-minute episode where they tried to answer this question. How do I get out of going to work on Monday? Okay, apparently these are the real life issues that young people who are maturing into adulthood are struggling with, okay? In July of that same year, 37 minute episode, spent the entire 37 minutes talking about is it okay to eat cereal three times a day? Do anybody agree with that one? Like, yes, you got to have raisin bran for breakfast, you've got to have Fruit Loops for lunch, what's for dinner? Lucky Charms. Let's roll with Lucky Charms, right? There we go. That, that's what they're struggling with. They went on with other episodes like how much money should you spend at the bar on a weekend and what do you do if your boss is a jerk, okay? Now, after five months of publishing this podcast, do you know what these young people did? They quit because they didn't want to go to work on Monday and their boss was a jerk, right? <laughs> or maybe they thought, no, that right there is everything that a person needs to know in order to be a fully functioning adult. And, and when I look at that, I, I am left just thinking about this thing that I say to my kids all the time. Look, I, I want my kids to know, based on what I see in society, that the bar is now so low in this culture, you literally should just be able to roll over it in order to be successful in our society, right? Because you just don't see a lot of maturity in the world that we're living in today, right? I'm looking at this, and some of you are probably going, I don't even know what you're talking about when you talk about this phrase, adulting. Well, it's a fairly new concept, and so just to make sure that we're all on the same page today, I'll define it for you. According to Urban Dictionary, adulting means to carry out one or more of the duties and responsibilities that are expected of fully developed individuals. So if you're a fully developed individual, you are mature by definition, okay? And so what do those responsibilities look like? Well, they give a couple of examples, such as paying off your credit card debt or settling beef without blasting people on social media. Like, like this is all it takes in order to be a mature, fully functioning adult in our world today, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I think it's interesting that we have even had to create a term to describe to grown adults what it looks like to act like adults. And the term that we created is actually not even a positive term. Talk to anyone under the age of 25, and they'll tell you that the term adulting actually has a kind of negative connotation, as though actually becoming an adult is not a good thing, it's kind of a, a bad thing, right? And yet this is the world that we're living in. We live in a world where there is a lot of people, there are a lot of people walking around who just lack a certain degree of maturity, right? You see it everywhere you look in your world. You can look at political leaders and say there's a lack of maturity. You can scroll through your social media feed all afternoon and you'll see one example after another example after another example of a lack of maturity, and I really do believe that the kind of immaturity that we see in our world today is the direct result of spiritual 
immaturity that we see in our world today. People are no longer looking to God and saying, okay, like God, what do you want me to do with my life as the ultimate mature being in the cosmos? But instead, what we do is we live as they did in the days of the book of Judges, where everyone in that book, the theme was everyone was walking around and doing what was right in their own eyes. Not in the eyes of God, but instead, people are walking around in a day when Israel had no king, and they just said, well, we'll just do whatever is right in our own eyes. And what that does is it breeds a tremendous amount of immaturity in our culture. In fact, John Piper, who I think is probably one of the great Christian thinkers of our day, he has said that the pathway to maturity, it's not through intelligence, but through obedience. So think about that. A lot of people think that maturity comes when you just grow up physically, when you go off to college, when you learn the hard lessons of life, when you read a few books, then you'll be a mature person. Not necessarily. There are all kinds of people who are very, very intelligent in our world, but they're not very mature. And it's because of what Piper is saying. The pathway to maturity is not through intelligence, but it's through obedience. And so what you do with sex, what you do with money, what you do with work and leisure, what you do with food and other people, those are not a matter of intelligence. Those are all matters of obedience. And so what we want is we want you to so grow in your faith in God that you would just say, I have so much faith in him. I will just be obedient to whatever he tells me to do in this book through the teachings of this book and through the example of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of faith that we're trying to develop in this series. And so, so far, I've been talking about the five ways that a person's faith naturally grows. Now, these five are not listed anywhere in the Bible, okay? But when you listen to people talk about their faith journey, what you typically hear is they point back to one of these five things or more than one of these five things. They'll talk about private spiritual disciplines, this idea that your faith doesn't just grow on Sunday. It has the potential to grow any day as you spend time with Jesus reading about his life and studying his teachings and looking at his example and then talking about the struggles in your life where you don't necessarily measure up, right? Your faith doesn't just grow on Sunday. It could grow any day as you practice private spiritual disciplines. In week two, we talked about personal ministry, in week three, we talked about pivotal circumstances, life-changing events that were designed by God to deepen your faith, not destroy your faith. This week, I want to take you to the fourth way in which your faith grows. It's called providential relationships. And I want to start by just explaining that term because I know that no one's walking around in society today talking about the new providential relationship that they started this last week. So let's just think about this phrase for just a minute. Most of you know from personal experience that the relationships that you have in life, they end up having a profound impact on the rest of your life. Okay, you know this. In fact, you've heard it said many times in many different ways. Some people say things like this. You are the average of the five people that you spend the most amount of time with. If you've never heard that, you need to think about that. You are the average of the five people that you spend the most amount of time with. Your relationships really do affect the future of your life. Or how about this one? Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You ever heard that? If you haven't heard that, you need to think about that. Because if you want to know what your future is going to look like, I could say, well, just show me your friends. Because ultimately what will happen is your friends, the way they think, the way they live, they will eventually rub off on you in life. And so show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Or how about this last one? The, the friends you choose will determine the quality and the direction of your life. All of these pithy little phrases are designed to help you understand 
that your life is very much affected by the relationships that you have. And while all of that is true, and I absolutely believe wholeheartedly every single one of those statements, I want you to know today that providential relationships, they are a little bit different, okay? Because this is not just about the friendships that you have. Instead, this is about the people that God sends into your life for a very specific reason. In fact, I would define providential relationships in this way. Providential relationships are the people that God strategically places in your life for the purpose of helping you grow up in your faith. In fact, if you listen to people talk, okay, they will often tell you about their faith journey and how their faith grew and how they got where they are. And they'll talk about the influence that other people had on their faith in God. In fact, you'll hear some people say things like this. Well, you know, when I was growing up in church, I had this student pastor, or I had this small group leader, and man, I don't know what it was, but we were just kindred spirits, and you know, we spent a lot of time with each other, and because of that relationship, my faith started to grow in ways that it had never grown before. You'll hear people talk about that. You'll hear other people say something like this, um, well, we were living there in that neighborhood, and then all of a sudden, the house next door went up for sale, and it sold, and these new neighbors moved in. And the more we got to know them, the more we saw a side of Christianity that we didn't even know existed. And because of them, man, our faith in Jesus, it started to grow in ways that it hadn't grown in years. Or sometimes you hear people say this. Sometimes people will say, well, I had this coworker, and I looked at their life and I looked at their marriage and I looked at their kids and I just had so much respect for them. And then one day they invited me to go to church with them and I realized why they are where they are and why I am where I am. And I started going to church with them and God used them in my life to grow my faith. All of those scenarios would be people who are describing what we're calling today providential relationships. They're not just talking about the friendships or the relationships that they had. It's bigger than that. They're talking about God-ordained relationships where God put someone in their life for the purpose of growing them up in their faith. Now, a lot of times when people see these kinds of relationships, they'll look at these relationships and they'll say things like, well, it just seemed like it was accidental. Like these people came into my life out of nowhere. But after they have spent years in relationship with them and they've seen how God used those people to grow their faith, they'll look back and they'll say it wasn't accidental. It was providential. It wasn't a random thing. It was a God thing. And the reason this is so important for you is because if you don't understand how God works to grow your faith, then here's what will happen. God will send people into your life and then you'll let those people walk right out of your life because you didn't know that God was going to use them in such a great way in your faith journey. In fact, I look at my own life, okay? I'm 42 years old, I think. And over the course of the last 42 years, I can see very clearly how God put certain people in my life for the purpose of growing my faith. In my early 20s, Steph and I had just gotten married and we moved to Louisville, Kentucky. And God put this man in my life named Chuck Lawless. I met him just a couple of weeks after I'd been in the city of Louisville. And Chuck and I, we had um, one thing in common. He had a father wound in his life, and I had a father wound in my life. The difference between Chuck and me is that Chuck was about 15 years ahead of where I was in the healing process. He had already worked through his father wound. He had learned to forgive his father. He had learned to have a relationship with his father that was healthy, and I hadn't. And because of the relationship that Chuck and I had, Chuck ended up coming to me one day and he ended up saying, look, Brandon, I love you and I care about you. And what I see in your life is a father wound that you haven't dealt with. And if you don't deal with how you see your earthly father, then it's eventually going to affect how you see your heavenly father. And he started to 
do life with me. And God used him in an incredible way to build my faith and my understanding of God in a way that it still exists today. Years later, I would end up moving to Canton, Ohio, and I would meet this guy there. His name was Dwight Mason. And Dwight was one of these guys who's really um, kind of a unique character. In fact, I don't know if I have ever met anyone like Dwight in that Dwight had a crazy faith, okay? And by that, what I mean is that Dwight would believe that God could do things or would do things that most people would never even consider, much less pray for. But Dwight was one of these guys who would just tell you, in fact, his life motto, if he could sum it up for you, he would say it's two words, only God. His whole life, this is what he wanted. He wanted to experience things and to accomplish things in his business that could only be described as a God kind of thing. And so I spent a lot of time with Dwight over the course of almost five years. And over the course of those five years, I just watched Dwight live out this crazy faith where he would believe God for things and ask God for things that most people would not believe God for or ask God for. And because of what I saw in his faith and because of the way that I saw God respond to his faith, it started to grow my faith in all kinds of ways. I'm telling you, you spend time with a guy like that. And it will grow your faith. I've had these kinds of relationships in my life. And here's what I believe is true about you. A lot of you have had these kinds of relationships in your life. In fact, a lot of you right now are thinking about specific people. It may be your mom or your dad. It may be a friend or a coworker or a neighbor. But you're thinking about specific people and you go, man, I look back on it and I know. I would have never called it a providential relationship before. But I'm telling you, I know that God put them in my life for the purpose of growing me in my faith. Now, the question is, how do you know if God really put someone in your life for the purpose of growing you in your faith? Because here's what I know is true about some of you. Some of you, you thought that this person was a providential relationship in your life, but they didn't deepen your faith. They actually damaged it. Why? They may have been a pastor, may have been a, a student minister, may have been a small group leader, just a godly person that you had respect for. It's, it's because things changed in them. And so when I look to see whether or not someone is going to be a providential relationship in my life, two things have to be present. I will know that they are a providential relationship by what I see in them and by what I hear from them. And if what I see in them doesn't look like Jesus, and what if I hear from them is not about Jesus, they can't be a providential relationship in my life. Right? In fact, some of you, you had a relationship with people and they were great people, but you didn't see Jesus in them and you didn't hear Jesus from them and they had an influence on your faith, but it wasn't for good. It was actually for bad. And so today I want to take you to a story. It's found in John chapter 4. You can follow along in a Bible or you can pull it up on the Mosaic app and follow us along in your notes that we put in there for you. But what you see in John chapter 4 is this story about a woman who has this experience with Jesus. And it's an unbelievable experience. It changes her life. And then God uses her to help other people in their faith. Now, I need you to know something about this story before I show you the text. Um, this woman lived in an area called Samaria. And you just need to know, this is a really strange place for Jesus and his buddies to be hanging out because Jesus and his buddies were Jewish. And typically speaking in that day, there was a lot of tension between Jews and Samaritans. They didn't get along well with one another. In fact, a lot of people who were Jewish in that day, they would come to the region of Samaria and they would take a really long bypass around Samaria because they didn't want anything to do with the Samaritans. And so they wouldn't go through the area. They would go around the area. And in some cases, it would take them as long as three extra days to walk just so they didn't have to see Samaritans. But listen to me. Jesus is going right through the heart of Samaria, not because he's lazy, but because he loves the Samaritans. And there's a woman in there who needs to meet Jesus. And because Jesus is going to step into her world. 
And he's going to step into her life. It's going to change the rest of her life forever. And then God's going to use her to help everyone in her hometown come to faith in Jesus. I want you to watch this. John chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. Watch this. It says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? So Jesus is resting from his journey. He's chilling out on the edge of this well. The text says that his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. And so he says, give me a drink. And she says to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, you read that like I read that and you think, That's kind of weird. I'm not sure what Jesus is trying to get at. And it's because if you don't understand what Jesus normally does, this story will never make any sense. And so know this about Jesus. One of the things that Jesus does is he often uses an object in the physical world to teach us a spiritual truth. Okay, And so in this story, what Jesus is doing is he's saying, I'm going to use water. I'm sitting at a well. She's got a bucket. She's drawing water out of the well. I'm going to use water water, an object in the physical world, to teach her a spiritual truth. And so Jesus starts talking about water. Now, the problem with this woman is that she's struggling. She's a little slow to understand what Jesus is doing. And so Jesus slows it down. He says, look, just like your body needs water in order to be healthy and satisfied, your soul need something in order to be healthy and to be satisfied. And Jesus starts to talk about water. And the problem with this woman is the same problem that a lot of us have. We're great at caring for our physical bodies, but sometimes we neglect our soul. And so think about your own life. A lot of you, you take great care of your body. You you exercise. You're very careful in terms of what you eat and what you drink. You go see your doctor on a regular basis. You take your vitamins and your meds. Like You take great care of your body. And Jesus is looking at this woman and he's going, I want to teach you as important as it is for you to care for your body, it's even more important that you learn to take care of your soul. There are a lot of people who have a healthy body, but they have a sick soul. Or to go back to the water imagery that Jesus is using, there are a lot of people who might be physically hydrated, but they're spiritually dehydrated. And it's because there are longings and there are cravings that live inside of you. And you've never distinguished between the cravings in your body and the cravings in your soul. And so you've got these longings that long to be satisfied. And Jesus is going to help her understand that there is nothing in this world that can satisfy your soul. It's like being out on Horn Island on a hot summer day, right? You get out there, you get baked, you get hot, you get thirsty, you run over to the cooler, you open it up, and your stash has been depleted by all of your friends. What kind of friend does that to you, right? And so you're going, man, I got nothing to drink. And yet, here's the situation that you're in. You're surrounded, completely surrounded by water that looks really, really good, And it looks like it would be incredibly satisfying. But we all know that that water will not satisfy you. It will only kill you faster. And this is Jesus' point. Jesus wants her to understand that you have longings and cravings in your body. Yes, but you have cravings in your soul. And the things in this world, the physical things in this world, they will never satisfy your soul. Instead, they will only kill you faster. And so Jesus says, what you need in your life is you need living water. Because this is not a longing in your body. This is a longing in your soul. 
So you need to know something about this woman. This woman has spent her entire life looking for something or for someone to satisfy the cravings in her soul. Cravings that really only Jesus can satisfy. And because she's been looking to things in the physical world to bring about satisfaction, she has always been left feeling disappointed. And so in this immediate story, this woman is looking for water to satisfy her soul. And she says, you don't need that water. You need living water. But this woman will eventually open up to Jesus and they'll actually have a conversation about the fact that she's not just looking for water to satisfy her. She has been living her whole life looking for men to satisfy her. In fact, she says to Jesus, she says, I've had five husbands over the course of my life. And the man I'm living with now is not my husband. And it creates this whole conversation between her and Jesus about the fact that when you're trying to satisfy the soul with things from this physical world, it creates all kinds of disappointment. And so this woman, what would happen is she would jump into a relationship with a man and she would expect the man to meet a need in her life that only Jesus can meet in her life. And when he didn't meet the need that Jesus is only capable of meeting, then she would get frustrated with him and they would start arguing and they would start fighting and the relationship would explode in violence and then she would leave that relationship and she'd jump into another relationship and she would place the same expectations on that next man in her life. I've got cravings. I've got needs. I've got a longing in my life and I'm expecting you to meet a need that only Jesus can meet. And because he's not capable of meeting that need, the relationship would ensue and there would be conflict, there would be outrage, there would be disappointment, there would be frustration, there would be fighting, and then the relationship would end. And she'd jump into a relationship always thinking that the problem is with the man that I'm in relationship with, not the problem is with something going on on the inside of me. It was a failure on her part to understand that there is a difference between the cravings of the body and the cravings of the soul. And so in his commentary on this very passage, Mark Driscoll describes this woman's problem. And this is how he says it. Never leave me. Never forsake me. Never abandon me. Never betray me. Always forgive me. That's a resume for Jesus, not a man. This is her problem. This woman is a passionate worshiper of the wrong thing. She worships love. She worships men. She worships relationships. She doesn't worship Jesus. Men have become her God. The bed has become their altar. And she is sacrificing herself as a living sacrifice in worship to her false God. And it's not just happening in her life. I mean, let's just be honest. A, a lot of us have made the same mistake that she is making. She just didn't know that there was a difference between the cravings in her body and the cravings in her soul. Not only has she been disappointed and frustrated with every man in her life, but she's probably a woman who felt ashamed. She's probably felt rejected. She's probably felt used and even unloved. But Jesus is traveling right into the heart of Samaria because he loves her and he wants to change all of that. And so he comes to this little town and he wants to explain to her the difference between the cravings in the body and the cravings in the soul. He wants her to understand that there isn't anyone or anything in this world that can satisfy your soul. What's going on in your soul can only be satisfied by Jesus and the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives to everyone who follows him by faith. And I need you to know the same thing. Because I think a lot of us are looking to things in the physical world to satisfy a spiritual craving in our lives. And so this woman experiences a very 
real turning point in her life. It's just a few verses later, John chapter 4, verses 24 to 26. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, God is spirit. This is not a physical thing. This isn't about your body. This isn't about physical cravings or physical urges. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. And right here, this woman realizes who Jesus is and what Jesus came to offer. And she has a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ sitting on the edge of this well in the middle of this region called Samaria. Now, a lot of you have probably been listening to me tell the story and read the story, and you think, oh, I get it. Like the providential relationship is God sent Jesus into Samaria and Jesus sat down on the well and he waited for this woman to come and they met one another and Jesus had this conversation with her and then her faith in Jesus, it really grew and Jesus was the providential relationship in her life. That, that's all true, but there's a twist in the story. This woman who at one point in her life was probably very far away from God, it is now going to be used by God to actually be a providential relationship for everyone in her own town. Okay, it, it is an incredible privilege and it is an unexpected twist in the story. Look at verses 28 to 30, just a couple of verses after she realizes who Jesus is and what Jesus offers. The text says this, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, I want you to come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of their town and they made their way toward him or toward Jesus. Now, let me explain a little bit more about this woman to you. This woman was from a really little town called Sikar in the region of Samaria. And this town of Sikar is so small that everyone in this town would have known about her story. And so this is a woman in a small town who has a reputation. And because of her reputation, the people in this town are very unlikely to see her, out of all people, as a person that God would put in their life in order to grow their faith. Like, okay, maybe the priest or maybe the guy over at the synagogue is going to be used by God to grow my faith. But her? Like, she's going to be the one who grows my faith. In fact, most women in that town, they didn't even associate with this woman. She was the kind of woman that they would have talked about, but they would have never talked to. In fact, if you read the entire story, you'll discover that this woman went to the well during the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day. All the other women in town would have gone in the early part of the day because the early part of the day was much cooler and drawing water out of a well for your family, that was very demanding, physically speaking. And so they would lower the bucket in the well and they would let it fill up with water and then they would have to haul this thing out of this big deep hole and then they would have to put it on their shoulder or their head and carry it all the way back to their home so that their family would have water for that day or for the next couple of days. And so those ladies wanted to naturally get that work done early in the morning while it was still cool. But not this woman. This woman said it's more tolerable for me to endure the heat of the day than to put up with those women who I know are going to be talking about me in terrible, terrible ways. And so when she has this encounter with Jesus and she goes back to her town where everyone knows her story, everyone's labeled her, she has a reputation in all of their eyes, she starts to talk about Jesus. And listen to what she said. I'm quoting the text. It says, I met a man who told me everything I ever did. To which the people in that town probably looked at her and said, everything you ever did? D did you tell them about Bruce? Did you tell them about Greg? How about Bill and Todd? 
Did you tell them about those guys? Did you tell them about your last husband, John? Did you tell them about Jerry? Like, did you tell them about everything you ever did? And I imagine that this woman spoke to them with an incredible sense of humility and maybe even a spirit of remorse as she talked about all the things that she had ever done over the course of her life. And I don't know exactly how the conversation went, but I do know this. There was something that they saw in her and there was something that they heard from her that made them go, we need to go look into this for ourselves in spite of her reputation. Verses 39 to 42, it says this, many of the Samaritans from that town, watch this, believed in him because of the woman's testimony. That's a providential relationship right there. We didn't believe in Jesus, but because of what we see in her, she's speaking with a spirit of remorse over the life that she lived and everything that she's ever done. And because of what we hear from her talking about Jesus, because of what we have heard from her, we believe our faith has come into existence. That's a providential relationship. She says, he told me everything I ever did, verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed for two more days. And because of his words, watch this, many more became believers. These are people who are coming to faith in Jesus. Their faith is growing. Verse 42, they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard from for ourselves and we know I believe they're moving from faith to certainty now, okay? We're not just believing. We know that this man, Jesus, really is the Savior of the world. Now, do you know how easy it would have been for everyone in that town, everyone who knew their story, knew her story, to allow this woman to walk into their life and then allow this woman to walk right out of their life? It would have been very easy. But they didn't. They clinged to what she was saying because they saw two things in her. They saw her acting with a sense of urgency. And they saw her speaking with a spirit of transparency. So let me talk about urgency. Okay. By the time this woman has realized who Jesus is, The text tells us that his disciples had already come back from the town and they had food. So they're going to eat a quick bite and they're going to continue on their journey and they're going to get out of Samaria. But this woman acted so quickly with such a deep sense of urgency that the text says she left her water jar at the well and she ran back into that town and she tells everybody, you got to come see this guy. He's a man who has told me everything I ever did. So she acted with with urgency and she spoke with great transparency. She was willing to talk about everything that she ever did. She was willing to speak with transparency, to talk about every broken marriage she had ever had. She was willing to talk about the failing relationship that she was currently in. She was now able to describe to the people that she had longings in her soul and she had always thought they were longings in her body. She was able to explain that she had spiritual needs that she thought could be met in physical ways. And now she's realizing that this is a need that can only be met by Jesus. This woman had both urgency and transparency. So let me talk to two groups of people as we wrap it up. First group of people, there's probably a group of people who are here today, people who are watching online, and you have had a small taste of what it feels like to be a providential relationship in the life of another human being. God has used you in some way to grow someone else's faith. And you know how awesome that is. You know what an honor it is. You know what a high calling it is. You're like, man, like I have been looking for purpose my entire life and nothing gives me that sense of purpose and fulfillment like helping someone else in their faith journey. And so it's incredible. But in order for you to grow in your ability to be used by God in this kind of way, 
you have to learn how to grow in both urgency and transparency. We've all heard, let's start with urgency. We've all heard that phrase, the window of opportunity. The window of opportunity is real, but the window of opportunity is always closing. It's why you've got to act with urgency like this woman did. So students, the sports season that you're in right now, it is going to come to an end. You will graduate high school. And when you graduate high school, you will go your way and all of your friends will go their way. Young adults, you will get a new roommate. You'll get tired of each other. You'll get married. They'll get married. You're going to get a new roommate one day. You're new in the work environment. You'll get a new job. They'll get a new job. You'll go your way. They'll go their way. And you'll probably never see them again. You're going to move out of the neighborhood. They're going to move out of the neighborhood. You're going to retire. They're going to retire. You're going to die. And they're going to die. And the window of opportunity that we have to help other people grow in their faith. It is a window that is going to close. And it's why we need to act with a sense of urgency. But we also, in order to get this right, we have to act with a sense of transparency. What, what you see in this woman is a willing to talk about her biggest regrets and her deepest wounds. But something happens when you talk about your biggest regrets and your deepest wounds. When you talk about those things, it helps other people talk about those things. So when you share your story, it helps other people open up to share their story. When you trust them enough to say, let, let me tell you about my biggest regret, they start to trust you enough that they share their biggest regret. When they feel like you're, fe you're saying it's safe with them, they feel like it's got to be safe with you. And so what happens is it not only creates an environment for you to talk about your wounds, but it gives you an environment and an opportunity to talk about Jesus who came into the world to heal our wounds and to forgive our sins. And so it's why we don't just act with urgency, but we also speak with transparency. See, here's what's going to happen in your life. You're going to feel one day the Holy Spirit of God nudging you. Go ahead, tell him your story. And you're going to think to yourself, man, like I don't know if I want to talk about my biggest regret or my deepest wound. And the Spirit's going to go, go ahead, man, tell him your story. And in that moment, you'll either ignore it or you'll be obedient to it. Remember, real maturity is not through intelligence. It's through obedience. And so we be obedient and we share our story in a transparent way. And we help people understand that through Jesus, we found healing. Through Jesus, we began to realize that, yes, I've got longings in me, but they are not just physical cravings. There are spiritual cravings that can only be satisfied by Jesus and the spirit that he gives to his people. And as you grow in urgency and transparency, what starts to happen is you will move from ordinary relationships into providential relationships. And there's nothing in the world like it. Others of you, though, you're here today and you're going, um, I've never been used by God in that way. And it's because you've never been real with Jesus. Okay, before this woman could be transparent with everyone else, she had to be transparent with Jesus. She had to talk about her biggest mistakes and her biggest regrets. And yet, here's what I want you to remember, okay? Just like Jesus knew everything about this woman, he already knows everything about 
you. And he still loves you and he's invading your world and your space in your life this morning because he wants to have a relationship with you so that he can start to meet those cravings in your soul in a way that only he can satisfy with his relationship and the power of his Holy Spirit. And so today I hope you would respond just like this woman did by simply putting your faith in Jesus Christ, his ability to forgive your sins and become the leader of your life. Let me pray for you. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want you just to whisper to God right where you sit. You don't even have to be vocal about it. He knows your heart. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I need you to satisfy the cravings in my spirit. God, I've been trying to satisfy spiritual needs with physical things, and it's just not working. It's made me disappointed. It's made me frustrated with others. It's left me feeling rejected and lonely, unloved. So Jesus, I'm turning to you. I want you to be the forgiver of my sins and the leader of my life. If that's a prayer that you just prayed, I just want to ask you to do me a favor. I want you to send us an email I want you to call the church office. I want you to hop on the Mosaic app. Send us a Facebook message, whatever you need to do, and just let us know about what God is doing in your life. See, the next step for you is to follow Jesus publicly by going forward in baptism, like the baptisms that we saw today. And we would love to help you start that relationship with Jesus and go public with your faith in him, like those who have been baptized this weekend. God, for the rest of us, I just want to pray for those who do know Jesus. God, I pray that we would live with a greater sense of urgency. And I pray, God, that you give us the courage to speak with a spirit of transparency. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.